Let's try this again. <laughs> oh, it's wonderful to do shit live. Hello, everybody. I am your host, the Boozy Badger, Boozy Barrister, and you are here with another episode of Boozy's Legal Funhouse. Because I love the opening I did while my dumb ass had the feed <laughs> muted, I am joined tonight by our prosecutor from the Midwest. You know him, you love him. It's Scuff and Ding. Say hi, Scuff. Hi, Scuff. There we go. You see, he got the joke. The first time when we were muted, he didn't get the joke. He he said, hi, everybody. I'm like, oh, the fuck? That's not funny. Oh, welcome to Boozy's Legal Funhouse, a podcast regarding general legal topics, cases, history, and whatever tends to catch my fancy. I am, as I said before, your host, the Boozy Badger, Boozy Barrister. If you're wondering about why things may seem a little fucked up like the opening tonight, it's because Boozy's Legal Funhouse is always recorded somewhat live in front of a virtual audience over at twitch.tv slash boozybadger every Monday at 7 p.m. before going up one week after recording on the following Wednesday morning on your favorite podcast service if you're listening to us on one of those podcast services i have one brief favor to ask and that is you go to whatever rating system they use and hit five stars i don't care if you like it or not i really don't this is for my benefit solely to drive me up the algorithm charts however if you do like it you can also go to patreon.com slash lawyers and liquor and become one of our patreon supporters and on that vein before we get started tonight i do have to give a shout out to all of our five dollar level and above patreon supporters over at patreon.com slash lawyers and liquor so a special thank you to jeremy the head fox and Wolf in a Barrel, Dragor, Jack of All Corks, Nikolai, Tezcat, Magic Jag, Waylon DeRoche, Beaten, Dose of the Trash Panda, Eddie the Weatherfox, Mark Beckwar, Mama T, Uncle Kage, Ash Jeeves, Lisa Lupe, Mark Phaedrus, Netherlinks, Pandemonium, Hawk, Petroff, Neutrino, Scott Skunk, Tarrant, Buddy Goodboy Esquire, CC Otter, Chroma Hydra, David Hunter, Ed B. Kelly, Evie Solace, Feck, Ghost Goat, Grace Jane Gollinger, Ian Delahorn, Jason Knight, Just Dave, Just James, Calic, Coma Blood Paul, Mark Whipple, Michael Blocker, Sean Rabbit, The Dragon Show, Wheelie, and Zeros the Lion. I always love reading off the names of those supporters because it sounds like I have a minor zoo just fucking going in here. It's got to be so confusing for people who are tuned in. They're like, this is a serious law podcast with lawyerly people, and they are talking about lawyerly things. And did that motherfucker just say ghost goat? No. <laughs> His guest is named Scuff Endings. <laughs> I mean, have you said, have you done the, like, uh, my friend Scuffles the Rat had a really funny story uh, not, for me? Yet? Not yet, not yet. I really need to at the office and just see who catches it. And as I say at the office, here is the disclaimer that goes at some point, normally at the beginning of every single episode. While the people talking tonight are licensed attorneys, we are not your attorneys. For those of us who accept clients from the general public, the only way we become your attorney is if you are located in our jurisdiction. Contact us. Come in. Discuss a legal matter with us. We agree to representation. You pay us a retainer fee of our choosing, not your choosing. Don't PayPal me a buck and say you have a lawyer on retainer. And an engagement letter is signed. If all of those things have not occurred, we do not represent you. And no attorney-client privilege and no attorney-client relationship exists solely because you tuned into a podcast boozy's legal funhouse is an inf entertainment informational educational and hopefully funny podcast for you to listen to but we are not a substitute for the advice of a licensed attorney in your jurisdiction for the love of god do not go out there and apply anything you hear tonight and say a fat guy who pretends to be a cartoon badger on the internet told me it was okay it won't hold up in court so, we got some legal news to talk about. I didn't give Scuff any of the legal news tonight. Like, I gave That's Scuff fine. the case tonight. Tonight, we are talking about the older case of R.V. Dudley and Stevens. Now, if you tuned into the episode last week, then you know that R.V. Dudley and Stevens is the follow-up case to another case called U.S. v. Holmes from 1841 in the United States of America, where they held the premise that the defense of necessity will not uh, justify yeeting your passengers overboard during a shipwreck. We are moving tonight after our legal news segment 40 years down the road and across the 
pod to re-examine the defense of necessity and high seas murder this time with some of that tasty tasty long pork that's right human flesh eating and the law this evening on episode 13 the necessity of eating people before we do that though i want to move into the legal news now the obvious legal news tonight is uh is basically Chauvin's case. It, it, it is. Have you been keeping up with Chauvin's case at all? God, no. Yeah, I, I, I was hoping that you would say that. I, I they have gone into uh, into the defense arguments, the closing arguments. They gave it to the jury. The jury is now sequestered, and they are deliberating. Uh, there's a possibility by the time that this gets released on a podcast service, uh, there will be a verdict in the matter. Scuff, you're a prosecutor. What are your thoughts? Uh, juries do weird things. And in cases where the thing I tell everybody is when you're actually in a courtroom in a very big case where very bad things have happened, and you do it a lot. One of the things you learn early on is that no one really looks that guilty in the defense chair. Everyone just looks like a person. They look scared. Uh, They have an entire life, and you're trying to make judgment on them for the worst moment in their life. And it really doesn't matter who they are or what they did. So there are no guarantees. Human beings by nature aren't really designed to judge people and really aren't designed to ruin other people's lives in a single moment of judgment. So there are no guarantees when a jury goes back to deliberate. It's like literally the most stressful thing ever when you like hand something to the jury and like all you can do is you just sit there and you go through every statement you made, every piece of evidence you made, every answer that anyone gave And you are, like, obsessing over the fact that, like, man, what if they latch on to this detail? So you never know. It's, I mean, it's stressful. Like, I think that this, I think he should be found guilty and, like, have consequences. But I am not one of the 12 people who will make that decision. Let me ask, in your experience as a prosecutor, uh, what would you say is the... uh, the goal here, do you want the jury out for a long time? Do you want them out for a short period of time? If you're sitting in the prosecutor's chair right now, what are you looking for from the jury? Uh, I mean, the, this is, I mean, like, there's no way to not sound like a total cop out here. The, there is no sign. Um, I've had juries come back in three minutes, and I was like, well, three minutes, it's not guilty. And they're like, no, guilty. And like, just like, what? And the jury's, uh, um, for people who don't know, after a jury gives its deliberation, they can, if they want to, I keep kicking my camera, it's going out of focus. The jury can, if they want to, stop and talk to the prosecutor and the defense attorney. They don't have to, but they can. Um, And sometimes we get to talk to the jury and you get to figure out what they deliberate on. And I've had three minute verdicts where they're like the, you know, the longest part of this was selecting a foreman. Like he was guilty. Um, and then I have three minute, not guilty verdicts. And it's been serious cases that I've had very short verdicts on. I have had jury be out for 36 hours once. And I was like, there's no way they're finding them guilty. They've been, they've been deliberating this case for 36 hours. No one, no one finds someone guilty after 36 hours and they found him guilty. Um, so I don't know. One of the things you look for is questions. Juries are allowed to ask questions um, while they're deliberating. And sometimes the questions will give you kind of a, a sense of what they're hung up on uh, and what they're deliberating on. But not, there's no like silver bullets. There's not like anyone who's trying to you know, prognosticate right now is full of shit, to be honest. <laughs> well, because I mean, you hear that, right? You, you hear that. You hear that. Uh, you know, oh, they were out for a really short period of time. It's definitely X or it's definitely Y and and all that. And that it doesn't mean anything. It means absolutely however long. Either you proved your case really well or they proved their case really That's all it means. You can't take it one way or the other. Plus, I mean, juries make 
decisions on really stupid shit. Right. A, a jury could come back with a quick verdict simply because they don't want to spend another night in the fucking hotel. Yeah. If they're sequestered. I mean, I mean. It, it's a, it's a weird, it, it's a weird process and it's, there's no guarantees. And the evidence in this case is so overwhelming. It's not like it's scary, but I've had, you know, I've had 11 to one. It only takes one juror to, I mean, Boozy says this all the time. He only needs one. It takes one juror to hang a jury. Uh, I never, I didn't try this case, but a friend of mine was child, try, uh, trying a child rape case. And the evidence was overwhelming that this guy was guilty. And one juror came back not guilty and he said, I'll never believe a f- like something a four-year-old says. Oh, Jesus Christ. And, but I mean, that's all it takes. Yeah. That's all it takes is one person, like one person ma- makes it through voir dire who does not think a police officer can murder someone who is a criminal. And that's a not guilty or that's a hung jury. And the problem is when you have one person holding out, what really it will come down, it can come down to is how hard do other jurors want to fight and be forced to stay there until the judge will let you declare a hung jury? Because judges don't necessarily let you let a jury hang just because they're at an impasse. Sometimes they'll say, go back and keep deliberating. My judges in my last jurisdiction were not like that. Like the minute a jury said, we're at an impasse, the judge is like, mistrial hung jury and it was over but like there's lots of judges who are like you've been deliberating for eight hours i've had juries deliberate for two weeks go back i I like to think the judges said it just like that too like they jumped up mistrial hung jury waving their arms like kermit the frog we had judges who would do that they were like (laughs) that animated like, well, I guess it's a mistrial. Like, that is not an exaggeration of how some of my judges were. And it was like, okay, yes, they happen. I'm, I'm sorry. It's not funny. But well, I know mean, it is funny because now I'm it imagining like the Kermit the Frog rah! and waving his arms as he's mistrial. Oh, my God. Well, let, let's talk about a little legal news uh, tonight. Uh, as always, I yanked these from the ABA Journal because I'm a lazy fuck. Uh, and the first one on there tonight is is going to be, uh, can opening the door evidence doctrine violate the confrontation clause? It's a case that's going up in front of the Supreme Court of the United States. They declared uh, today, actually, that they would decide whether or not trial testimony for a criminal defendant can open the door to rebuttal evidence that otherwise would have been barred by the confrontation clause to the United States Constitution. Now, the confrontation clause is, uh, and Scuff, you, you can jump in here as our resident expert on that but it's essentially uh the amendment to the constitution that basically says you have a right to confront the people who are presenting evidence against you 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 have a right to have that evidence tested and tried in a court of law and if it is impossible for that evidence to be tested uh, by confrontation against it then uh it shouldn't be presented in the first place Oh, okay. Uh, that's I, a, I mean, like, so the confrontation clause. Um, I was, is, I was, I'm just, I was looking for so, a little more than. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so if I'm, so if I'm talking to Boozy and or if I see Boozy go out and commit a crime, he throws a beer bottle at his neighbor and hits her in the head, uh, and the police come and talk to me, and I say, yeah, I saw Boozy throw the beer bottle um, and hit her in the head, and then trial comes around and they can't find me. They can't, the police can't say, Scuff told us that Boozy said it. Um, now, there's two things. There's hearsay in the confrontation clause, but hearsay has a lot of exceptions. The confrontation clause has only a tiny, tiny number of exceptions. If something falls within the confrontation clause, you can only get around it in very, very, very limited circumstances. So what the Supreme Court is trying to decide is whether there's a circumstance where Essentially, if a defendant got on the stand and said, I've never said, I've never told anyone in my entire life that I was guilty of this murder, and the police have a recording of Davy Jones saying that he told me he committed murder, 
that would violate the confrontation clause to just play that recording. But because he opened the door by making a claim on the stand, theoretically, you could use that against them. So that's going to be the determination is whether a defendant can open the door. I imagine it, if they let it, it's going to be like bracketed and subclosed and like very selective circumstances where you can and like what the evidence has to be. Well, and to give you an idea of the case, the case uh, arises out of New York. Uh, it was a charge stemming from a shooting during a street fight in the Bronx that killed uh, a child passenger in a car. Okay. Uh, we have two defendants in the matter. One of them is our appealing defendant, Daryl Hemphill. Okay. Uh, the other defendant was tried for this crime, and that ended in a mistrial. Okay. Uh, the defendant then pled guilty to possession of a firearm uh, as the result of the mistrial. Yeah, the, you know how I said earlier, uh, or how Scuff said earlier, you only need one to hang a jury. This is why you only need one to hang a jury. You hang the jury, and sometimes you say, okay, we'll take a lesser charge uh, on that. So he pled guilty to the possession of a gun. Uh, the child that was killed was killed with a 9 millimeter. The other defendant in his allocution said, uh, I had a 357 Magnum. I did not have a 9mm. I had a 357. During a search of that defendant's apartment, the police have found a 9mm cartridge and ammunition for a 357. Now, at Hemphill's trial, the defense introduced testimony about the police finding a 9mm cartridge on the nightstand of the, the other defendant. Uh, the state then sought to introduce the other defendant's allocution at the plea, saying he had a 357. You can understand why this may be a confrontation clause argument, because a mistrial does not mean you are acquitted. A mistrial just means you weren't convicted. Uh, so they are arguing, you know, well, he had a 9 millimeter here. And the state's coming in and saying, well, Here's his plea agreement where he says he has a 357, but you're not going to be able to confront him. No sane defense attorney is going to let that person take the stand. And they have a right not to. They can say, I plead the fifth, I plead the fifth, I plead the fifth. You're never going to be able to confront that evidence, confront that witness, confront the possessor of it. So when they did that, when they originally were going, well, we want to introduce this, the court said, no, 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 it violates the confrontation clause. They can't actually confront the evidence about that 357 and who had it and the testimony of this guy at his allocution on that. He's going to plead the fifth as to everything. When the defense said, and they found a 9 millimeter at that guy's apartment, the guy who pled guilty, the state said, well, they've opened the door now. Scuff, what is opening the door? It basically means you've, by one of the questions you've asked, uh, by one of the questions the defense has asked a witness has allowed evidence that has previously been inadmissible to be admissible. So because of the confrontation clause, they couldn't call this guy. And because they couldn't call this guy, uh, the, th the 357, the, oh, well, he said he had the 357, wasn't admissible. You couldn't confront that witness. But the moment they said he had a 9 millimeter, then the prosecution said, oh, we should be able to rebut that by using... His allocution, which is just like a, a statement of what I done did wrong when you plea out by using his allocution statement in that. And now the Supreme Court is going to hear whether it was all right for the trial court to admit that over the confrontation clause. Thoughts, Scuff? I would really, really hope that they'd find that that was not admissible. I mean, like, that's that's like quintessentially why you have the confrontation clause and aside from that uh i mean if people don't know there's a there's a million ways the state can get around that you know the state could call that witness in rebuttal and when he pleads the fifth you can offer him immunity right you know you can offer him transactional immunity like you can do things the idea that this op <laughs> like it doesn't even it's not even about a statement it could be one thing if this guy had said, well, the other guy had confessed to having the nine millimeter. And that I think opens the door more than just, he had a nine millimeter. You're frequently dealing with evidence. Like this is not that different than a lot of cases I've had where like contradictory evidence is found that presents the idea. It might be another defendant. That's 
commonly a defense you don't and like no like i don't even think i would have thought to argue that it opened the door to like a, a non like a confrontational statement that's bullshit uh, I, <laughs> that's I say, this, stupid this is why i love having you on scuff because like normally i i jokingly refer to most prosecutors as uh you know the the stormtroopers of the empire here and and then you come on and you're like ha ha i was in the rebel alliance all along <laughs> um i mean but uh, you know, a lot, there are a lot of tools at your disposal to deal with this. Like, I hate that one of the things I hate most is when people are too lazy to understand their job. Like, as a <laughs> prosecutor, your your job is to understand how evidence comes in. Like, that's your whole job. The case, you know, you have your witnesses, you have the things you can and can't say. Your job is to figure out how to get the most things you can in. You have to know all the rules. You have to know every tool. And if you don't, you're not a good prosecutor. And I don't like when courts bail out bad prosecutors. <laughs> Be a better prosecutor. <laughs> I, could, I could teach you a fucking class on this. Oh, so, 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 so it's not that you have a good heart and a good spirit. It's more professional pride. Well, it's also, like, there's a reason why we have these rules. Like, there's a reason why you be a good prosecutor. It's because, like I say to everybody, you know, my job professionally, I am professionally responsible for deciding when it is legally appropriate to ruin someone's life. And the only way that decision becomes even marginally moral is if there are boundaries, there are checks and balances, and there are rules. And once you start degrading the rules, you just start degrading like every check and balance. Because I am solely within my rights and my discretion to charge a case the police send me. It Probable cause, which is the standard by which we charge cases, is nothing. It is nothing. It's if you take all of the evidence and you give the state the benefit that all of the evidence they're presenting is true, is it probable that a crime occurred and is it probable that the person I say committed it committed? That is nothing. That standard is nothing. One person saying Bob did the crime is enough for probable cause. So there have to be rules. There have to be checks and balances. And if you can't play by the rules, it's not the court's job to bail you out. And that's what's so weird about this case is they jump directly to open the door without any of the other steps that you can take. And this is literally why the confrontation clause exists. Because they, the confrontation, yeah. they really wanted that evidence in. I mean, they were chomping at the bit. Immunity. They were chomping at, why, why, why? Because you know, if you don't convict this guy, you gotta go back to that guy. I mean, you wanted to quit it. Well, I mean, but that's why you offer him testimonial immunity what? And then well, why but why it, it, it's almost like uh to go back to the shaman case honestly when people were talking about oh the guy who allegedly was dealing drugs won't testify and that means all this stuff and i'm like all that means is the da ain't closing the door to a third degree murder charge on the guy and they haven't a offered transactional immunity to him for whatever he says on the stand and why would you like that's uh, people think that there's some complex and people think a lot of weird things about how juries work. But one of the things I've learned is that you never give someone something to latch on to. If you've got a witness that doesn't really add a lot to the story and might plead the fifth on the stand and your only way to get him to testify is to offer him immunity and the defense attorney is going to get to go to town on the fact that weren't you offered immunity from third degree murder to testify against this police officer? What the fuck does that guy add that like, five videos of I, I can't pronounce the police officer's last name to save my life but Chauvin I think Chauvin he's standing on someone's neck for nine minutes doesn't tell you exactly why waste your time exactly it, is, it adds nothing it adds nothing to the prosecution's case and his defense attorney not Chauvin's the the alleged dealers would have been a real idiot to allow him to testify without an offer of immunity well, you, there's an old school prosecution thinking 
that is, and I'm sorry, this is going to be very regionalist, but really is an East and West Coast thing where the old school prosecutors who are elected and have been there forever think the way you try a case is you throw literally every piece of like potentially relevant evidence at, at the wall and hope a jury convicts. And like in the modern era, what most of us have learned is that's actually the worst thing you can do. Because as soon as you start throwing out theories, like in all of this stuff, all of that's doubt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just it's... tell your story. If it takes three witnesses to tell a murder story, call three witnesses. You don't just because the impact was big and bad doesn't mean the trial's going to be long. Right. Right. Moving on to lawyers behaving badly, or in this case, people who aren't lawyers behaving badly from the ABA Journal. April 16, 2021, a Florida man has been sentenced to federal prison after he impersonated an immigration attorney. Uh, Elvis Harold Reyes, 56, of Brandon, Florida, has pled guilty to mail fraud and aggravated identity theft in connection with filing more than 225 fraudulent asylum applications and collecting more than $411,000 from unknowing clients. He operated something called EHR Ministries and portrayed himself as an immigration attorney despite having never been licensed. He targeted undocumented immigrants who were seeking driver's licenses, work authorizations, and provided them with both false and inaccurate legal advice to persuade them to retain his services, representing people in front of the United States Citizen and Immigration Services boards on asylum relief and withholding of removal protections provided under the United Nations Convention Against Torture. He falsified information on their applications. He did not share information with them. He did not inform them of the consequences of filing for asylum uh, relief or for Convention Against Torture Protection. He has been sentenced to 20 years. It's a long time. Said Homeland Security Investigations Tampa Special Assistant uh, Michael Cochran. This criminal defrauded hundreds of victims who thought they were starting a path to legal citizenship. Identity and benefit fraud are crimes that threaten the national security and public safety of the United States by creating vulnerabilities to our legal immigration system. He spent the money on travel, luxury shopping, spa visits and jewelry, and an allowance for his girlfriend. He also <laughs> threatened anybody who said they would expose him by claiming he would have them deported. At least six of his victims were deported. Six others are now under removal and abstentia orders. And another who is actually married to a United States citizen may never be able to obtain legal status because of the fraud. Yeah, it's not that they wouldn't apply or they wouldn't have, uh qualify for u visas well I, I have a question on this scuff how often do you see the undocumented community preyed upon by charlatans uh, out there where you are i mean it'd be hard to say because a case like that probably wouldn't go state so we wouldn't we normally see it in our courtroom i have never seen a case like that but like that doesn't mean it doesn't happen uh there i mean as a background, there's multiple systems of law and prosecution. There's municipal level, that's like speeding tickets, misdemeanor stuff, not picking up your dog's poop. Then there's district court or state level offenses. That's when that's what I do. And then there's federal level. And those are for crimes that involve usually involve multiple jurisdictions across different states. Um, something like this is most likely a federal offense. And I most likely wouldn't see it because when this guy got 20 years to give you an idea, if he committed that crime, same crime in, and we charged him in Kansas, the most I could sentence him to would probably be 12 to 18 months because well, we have different. Let, let me ask you, and it's related to it because you see this a lot. You, you see people who are pretending to be lawyers or are pretending uh, do we have greater knowledge than they do preying on the undocumented community? Uh, how familiar are, are you with notario fraud? I don't know what that is. Oh, 
I'm about to teach you something. I'm okay. happy to learn. We have notary publics, right? In a lot of civil law jurisdictions, in a lot of Latin law jurisdictions, they have something called the notario publico. Okay? And the notario, for short. And that literally means notary public. All right? The thing is, is in the United States, our notary publics are essentially licensed witnesses. Like they, They're the ones who stamp, yes, I saw this. Yes, this is a certified act. In those countries, notario publicos can actually do some legal work. They can draft like simple wills. They can fill out legal forms for people. They have broader powers. So you have people in the United States who get a notary public license and then hold themselves out as notario publicos, saying, and if they're questioned, they go, well, it's just Spanish for notary public. But they absolutely know the impression that they are giving to immigrant and undocumented communities, which is I can do more for you than what a notary public is allowed to do. So people go to them to help them form businesses, to have wills drafted, uh, to file simple lawsuits, even for immigration work from time to time, because those are all things that they expect maybe in the bailiwick of a notario publico where they're from, and they aren't aware of the very limited role of notary publics in the United States. As a result, you have fraud. You have massive fraud, especially in high immigrant areas. Uh, I can tell you personally, my bar association, we have notices all over the place about this. All over the place. In English and in Spanish, saying a notary public cannot provide these services. That is notario fraud. Hmm. You know, I mean, what's scary is that probably is happening and our police just haven't gotten up caught up to it yeah well and it's because one of the reasons the police haven't caught up to it yet it preys on it's aimed towards communities that are vulnerable and you know when this when you, i read the phrase if you challenge me if you expose me i'm going to have you deported that's a common fear you see those communities get preyed on because that's the threat if you go to the police they're gonna deport you if you show up in court to sue me, they're going to find out you're undocumented and they're going to remove you from the country. It is why during the Trump administration, when I heard about ICE grabbing people at courthouses, my immediate thought was, that's fucking evil. That's evil. You are just yeah. telling this community they have no recourse at law if somebody harms them. I mean, you do not have to convince me that much of what ice does is evil <laughs> i don't think i have to convince you um, like i said you're uh, the you're the good member of the empire um <laughs> from from fake lawyers defrauding people to real lawyers getting in trouble our final news story tonight is a big log partner is no longer listed on the firm website after an accusation of misrepresentation to a federal court uh, a partner at Littler Mendelssohn and its Atlanta's office is no longer listed on the law firm's website after a company claimed it was thrown under the bus because of his misrepresentation in federal court. The attorney, Gavin Appleby, had gone into court uh, there and, uh, and apparently falsely told the court that ADP had never responded to a third party uh, subpoena for records when in reality ADP said it had provided responsive documents five business days after receiving the subpoena but the attorney did not hand those documents over to the plaintiff uh, it's um it's never a good thing when you see the words big law partner misrepresentation to federal court removed from website. Uh, now, that's not all he did, though, because when a show cause order was issued, uh, he didn't tell his client about it until the last minute. Uh, so the client wasn't able to send a represent representative, which resulted in a second order. Uh, they only found out about it when they retained counsel to investigate and was shocked to learn its own attorneys had made repeated material misrepresentations, subjecting it to potential contempt sanctions. 
Uh, now, Littler, of course, has said, Littler prides itself on high-quality client service. <laughs> we expect our attorneys to handle all client matters with care, responsiveness, and forethought while providing exceptional counsel. While we cannot share details about our representation in any one matter, we can assure you that we take very seriously if and when we fall short of these standards. In this case, as soon as we were made aware of the concerns, our management team took immediate and appropriate action. We are working to do all we can to remedy the situation. Apple, I can't tell if you're actually reading something. Or I, I am. Going, or if you're just going on rote by like standard corporate <laughs> apology <laughs> yeah. letter. I mean, like, like I am, but yeah. <laughs> well, I, my favorite part of the article is this line here. Appleby, the attorney who has now been removed from the site, told the ABA Journal that Littler had asked him not to reply to a request for comment. My apologies, he said in an email. <laughs> How, how good of a sign is it for your career that after they accuse you of misrepresenting facts to a federal court, you're removed from the firm website? I mean, it's not a, it's not a good sign. <laughs> I mean, I, they're, obviously. They're probably just, they're working a buyout. I mean. Yeah, I, like they're, they're buying him out right now. Yeah. They're, I mean, they're like, for you're the, gone. For those, of you in, for those of you in the audience, uh, when you are a partner in a firm, the way they get you out of a, out, the way you retire is you literally sell your interest in the firm back to the firm. So when I say they're buying him out, they're negotiating how they're going to get him out the door. You know, how, how much is your equity worth once you've opened us up to potential liability for malpractice? Yeah. Or how, much is your, how much is your equity worth once you're disbarred? Yeah, keeping keeping in mind that whenever we pay you, that's what you got to live on because you're not getting a job as a lawyer again. Um, you don't lie to the court, and you definitely no. don't throw clients under the bus. No. So that that is our legal roundup for this week. Now let's go on to what everybody's here for: a case of high seas cannibalism. This is R.V. Dudley and Stevens that we're talking about tonight, and I want to give you a little bit of historical background. Now, last time we were talking about the case of U.S.V. Holmes, a case where a ship sank in the middle of the Atlantic in April, and the, the crew and passengers took to a lifeboat. And as the crew sat there, they decided that the lifeboats were a little too heavy and started yeeting passengers the fuck overboard. Looking at that, a United States court said, well, we understand the law of the sea in drawing lots. However, the defense of necessity, which is we had to take this action in order to prevent a greater harm. We had to throw these people into the sea to prevent the deaths of all these other people. The trolley problem of the ocean will not apply in this case specifically because they didn't start yeeting other crew members into the ocean first. They didn't start tossing crew members before they went to the passengers. The crew members just looked around and said, well, fuck y'all, and started throwing passengers overboard. That was the sticky wicket. That was the issue. The U.S. court said the crew should have drawn lots amongst themselves to determine who went into the ocean. And then when they got down to the bare minimum number of crew need to operate the boats, should have started drawing lots amongst the passengers. And then they may have a defense of necessity. That was 1841. We are now moving across the ocean to jolly old England uh, in the year of 18. 18- 84. An Australian lawyer, because it's lawyers all the way down, Jack Want, had decided that what he really wanted was a yacht. So Jack went to England and Jack bought a night a 52-foot 19-ton yacht named the Mignonette, a cruiser built in 1867 for inland shore sailing. And he decided that he would have that boat sailed all the way from England to Australia. In order to do that, he hired a crew of four people. Tom Dudley, the captain, Edwin Stevens, Edmund Brooks, and Richard Parker, the 17-year-old Calvin boy, an orphan, and an experienced seaman who had never sailed before. Now, the mignonette, which was made 
Keep in mind, for coastal cruising around England, took out to the high seas, and went around the Cape of Good Hope, running into a gale. The vessel, which uh, was not really built for those seas, uh, began to swamp and was doomed. The Captain Dudley ordered the single 13-foot lifeboat to be lowered, a boat of flimsy construction, and which had been holed in the chance to get away, hole basically being punched through. All four men climbed aboard and set adrift on the sea. They stacked there around 700 miles from land and were on the boat from uh, July the 7th until when were they picked up? They were picked up on, oh, July the 29th. So they were at sea for 22 days in a 13-foot boat. Luckily, they all survived. Except the cabin boy. They killed and ate him. They, they killed and ate the cabin boy. At some point, while the crew was catching things from the sea to stay alive, while the crew was bringing in turtles, was bringing in fish, uh, was drinking rainwater and their own urine, don't say a word, Scuff, and their own urine. <laughs> uh... They were able to stay alive, but on July 20th, Parker, being thirsty and inexperienced, began to drink seawater and made himself unwell. Now, the crew began discussing around the 16th, the 17th day at sea that they were going to draw lots to determine which one of them should be killed and eaten. However, with Parker falling ill, the captain told the others it was better that one of them die so that the other should survive and they should draw lots. Brooks refused. Dudley raised the matter again with Mr. Stevens. And Stevens said, you know, that kid's dying. So why don't we kill him? Because we have families and he's 17. So they took a penknife to him, cut his goddamn throat as he said, what me? And then they ate him. So what you're saying is we've moved from eating overboard to eating on board. Right! Yeah, well, it's always nice to have breakfast in bed when you're at sea. <laughs> the three men uh, fed, uh, as and I'm reading this directly from this, the three fed on Parker's body, with Dudley and Brooks consuming the most, and Stevens very little, which just makes me think they were keeping a fucking log. Like, like they were portioning it up like you do when you're splitting a candy bar amongst your children. Like, to make sure everybody gets an equal piece of Stevens. This uh, is an 1800s vessel. What They are absolutely keeping a log. Oh, yeah. Now, I, I loved it because Dudley, the captain, would later say... I can assure you, I shall never forget the sight of my two unfortunate companions over that ghastly meal. We all was like mad wolves who should get the most, and for men, fathers of children, to commit such a deed, we could not have our right reason. Now, this was roughly the 23rd or the 24th. They were rescued on July the 29th. Five days later, uh, they were picked up by a German sailing ship and they were taken to Cornwall on September 6th and route to uh, Hamburg. On arrival in Falmouth, Cornwall, all three of the survivors went to the Customs House and entered statutory statements under the Merchant Shippings Act, which is required in the event of shippings lost. And in those statements, they hid what they had done, you would expect. They absolutely did not hide what they had done. No. They, shockingly honest depositions. They, they, were, how they, said it. they were completely candid about the fact they killed and ate the cabin boy and why. Well, here's where we get into the sticky part. There was something at that time, and I touched upon a little last time, known as the Law of the Sea. And the Law of the Sea was basically custom of every man for himself. Or that when you're all on a lifeboat, maybe you yeet some folks the fuck overboard if it's swamping. Or if there's four of you in the boat and one of you has to die so the other three could live by eating your supple young flesh. That was accepted. It was okay. 
And these men were so candid because they believed that the widely accepted custom of the sea would protect them. And frankly, up until then, it had. This was a tested area of law. It was completely unsettled on whether or not you could say it was better for the three of us to kill and eat him than it was for all four of us to die under the defense of necessity. And it raised the interesting legal question that we saw in U.S. v. Holmes 40 years earlier. Should necessity be an excuse to murder with nothing more out there? The law of the sea had protected people through that time. It actually, believe it or not, a police sergeant had overheard them confessing, walked up to one of them and said, hey, that boy you just said you killed an eight, how'd you kill him? And like, oh, I used this knife. And the sergeant was like, oh, let me see that knife. I'll give it back later. This is a real exchange. <laughs> this happened. It was sent to the Board of Trade, all the depositions, and the survivors were so confident they would not be charged, they actually began to arrange to go home to their families when the order came for them to be detained. Now, the home office, which in Britain was like the office, uh, was told about it, but didn't really take any action. Warrants were issued for murder on the high sea. The three men were arrested, appeared in front of the magistrates. The Captain Dudley was actually very confident that the magistrates would dismiss the charges. This was so accepted at the time. Falmouth Cornwall being a shipping community that the mayor of the town came to the jail and apologized to the cannibals for the inconvenience. <laughs> they were actually held in custody and it caused a huge uproar there uh, because everybody in Falmouth, the area where they were being charged with this, supported them. These were sailing people. They understood the law of the sea. This was custom. As long as it was done fairly and reasonably. I think one of the best stories from the Wikipedia is that on a different lifeboat, they drew lots. And one of the crewmen draws the lot that says he's going to die and they're going to eat them. And the captain says, no, I'm the captain. Kill me. And the crew member says to the captain... No, how dare you deny me this honor? <laughs> and this this was an accepted thing. It was so accepted. The brother of Richard Parker, the brother of the boy who I cannot stress enough, they slit the throat of and ate in a lifeboat five days before being rescued. Was like, yeah, no, it makes sense. It's cool. I, I get it. I understand. He shook their hands. He was like, you should go. They should go home. Why are they here? So, um, this case, though, came against a really interesting legal background at that time in Britain. There had been many cases on the question of whether the defense of necessity would apply to murder in very similar circumstances to this. U.S. v. Holmes was one that was being considered. Uh, the Essex, the whale ship that caused Moby Dick, had been uh, talked about. Uh, there was a case of a crew from St. Christopher Island that had done that. Uh, the case of James Archer in Singapore, which almost went to trial, but then got dismissed because they couldn't really determine what the appropriate jurisdiction was. And England had been struggling in their criminal code with how to handle the defense of necessity when the crime was the taking of a life. So they took it to trial. And they got a very interesting judge, a judge named Baron Huddleston. I I had to fill scuff in about Baron Huddleston because this motherfucker sounds like either the most awesome judge or the most Bond villainish of judges I've ever heard of. Baron Huddleston was a judge who was going to sit over this case. Huddleston had been reputed to color code his gloves based on the type of trial he was hearing that day. And Huddleston had very strong opinions on whether the defense of necessity, which again, 
is a defense of we had to do this harm to prevent a greater harm. And specifically in regards to murder, we had to kill this person to preserve the lives of all these other people should apply in cases of murder. Specifically, no. He did not believe it should. But he was also very aware that a local jury was likely to acquit the four men as a result of the sympathy. So what did Huddleston do? Scuff, what did Huddleston do? He forbid them to give a verdict. Instead, what they did is he presented them with a factual scenario and all they could do is say whether or not they agreed with the facts he presented them they couldn't say they found him not guilty they could either find him guilty or they could agree with the facts as the judge laid them out except the judge didn't really uh follow through with what he said did he boozy well, it's funny because what he described was something in English law that was called a special verdict. And it was, I'm not asking you to say guilt or innocence. I'm just asking you to say these are the facts because I'm going to decide guilt or innocence. And this had been pretty common in England for a period of time. But none had been done for a hundred years at that point. This motherfucker brought out his black color gloves because black was his murder color his black clover gloves and dusted off a hundred year old precedent that was on the books so that he could make sure these motherfuckers would be found guilty because he believed necessity could not apply in these matters. Scuff, did I answer your question? Uh, yes, you you didn't get to the part where then he invented some facts the jury didn't agree oh, to. Oh, yeah, yeah, where he just made shit up. Yes, That's... the judge then proceeds, the jury come, the jury just deliberates with the judge. They do not agree with his original statement, and they want amendments made to some of the fact finding. And he says, sure, I'll, I'll make those amendments. And then the jury leaves... And the judge just writes whatever he wants. Yeah. And he, passes it off as if that was the special verdict. He actually, he uh, he described the boat as an English merchant vessel. It was not. Uh, when the jury was describing it, like, yeah, it's an English merchant vessel. That's what the jury agreed to. And then he's like, oh, no. And crosses it out and just writes the word yacht. <laughs> he described the lifeboat as an open boat. He took away lifeboat and put open boat, which are two different fucking things. <laughs> Just to be honest, a lifeboat has a certain connotation to it. An open boat makes it sound like you're out rowing on the fucking lake. Uh, he actually uh, then, <laughs> you gotta love it, uh, realized that in the facts, he had not put in a crucial fact. And that was the lifeboat was from the mignonette. So he added that in after all that was done. Because what he wanted was he wanted to return this special verdict. And then he wanted to go to a panel of like three judges that he knew would agree with him to uphold it. Uh, so when they found out that he kind of fucked up, they changed it again on it. It was very unclear. And the funniest part of this, the funniest part is like the judge was like, oh, well, uh, you know, we're going to do this. But the prosecutor was like, you know, we should just, like, give them clemency. We should convict them and immediately give them clemency on this. Like, it was obvious this had been done. We, we shouldn't uh, let them go out there on it. Uh, the prosecutor didn't seek to suppress any conditions on the boat. Uh, he was seeking royal clemency for them. The judge was like, Baron Hilson was like, no, fuck this. Fuck that. I want this verdict. Uh, was I alive in the 1800s and prosecuting naval crime in London? Yeah, maybe, maybe you are the reincarnation of the cannibalistic prosecutor. By God, that sounds like a horrible The prosecutor horror wasn't the cannibal. We don't know that! <laughs> 
<laughs> Maybe it was sympathy that got him there. Maybe he's like, yeah, who hasn't been there eating a 17-year-old? Um, I mean, I am a rat. We do eat things. So this went up to essentially kind of an appellate court called the Queen's Bench. And the Queen's Bench, sitting under Lord Chief Justice Coleridge, uh, came in and, and more or less uh, said, yeah, we're, we're going to agree. We're gonna we're gonna agree that necessity is not a defense to murder. Uh, killing somebody to preserve your own life or the lives of several people does not fall under that. Necessity is not uh, a a defense to murder. And this was a panel of judges uh, doing this. They actually state it. To preserve one's life is generally speaking a duty, but it must be the plainest and highest duty to sacrifice it. War is full of instances in which it is a man's duty not to live but to die. The duty, in case of shipwreck, of a captain to his crew, to the crew, to the passengers, of soldiers, to women and children, and in the noble case of the Birkenhead. These duties impose on men the moral necessity, not of preservation, but of the sacrifice of their lives for others, which in no country, least of all it is to be hoped in England, will men ever shrink as indeed they have not shrunk. It could be very easy and cheap display of commonplace learning to quote from Greek and Latin authors, from Horace, from Juvenal, from Cicero, from Euripides, passage after passage, in which the duty of dying for others has been laid down in glowing and emphatic language as resulting from the principles of heathen ethics. It is enough in a Christian country to remind ourselves of the great example whom we profess to follow. It must... Now, that sounds like a lot of fancy words, but what it's basically saying is, you should be willing to die before you kill someone. <laughs> you, like, like if it's not, you should be willing to die before you kill someone. Uh, the judges would go on to say that no man is qualified to make the decision as to who should live and who should die, arguing that if we allowed that, it could become a legal cloak for unbridled passion and atrocious crime. They were, however, aware of the predicament of the four men in the raft and stated it must not be supposed that in refusing to admit temptation to be an excuse for crime, it is forgotten how terrible the temptation was, how awful the suffering, how hard in such trials to keep the judgment straight and conduct pure. We are often compelled to set up standards we cannot reach ourselves and to lay down rules which we could not ourselves satisfy. But a man has no right to declare temptation to be an excuse, though he might himself have yielded to it, nor allow compassion for the criminal to change or weaken in any manner the legal definition of the crime. And what were Dudley and Stevens sentenced to upon Death. all of that? They were sentenced to death. They were. They were sentenced to... They said these motherfuckers have imbued themselves with the spirit of the young man by eating his flesh. We must destroy them. However, uh, as was actually somewhat typical in that time, they did not take very heavily to defenses of necessity or even insanity in that era, uh, the most common outcome was actually a conviction, followed by royal clemency. That is clemency from the crown, a pardon for the crimes committed of some sort. You actually saw that a lot in, in, in what we would phrase now to be insanity cases back then. They would say, well, being insane is not an excuse for having committed a criminal act. We're still going to convict you. However, the queen's probably going to pardon you after that. Uh, it was very much uh, put on that. Now, they were sentenced to death. Uh, they would have to be uh, issued a royal prerogative of mercy by Queen Victoria herself on the advice of the Home Secretary at that point in time. And while the Home Secretary, William, Secretary, Secretary William Harcourt, was generally against the death penalty... He was also really aware that these guys had just been convicted of murdering and eating someone and feared that commuting to anything other than life imprisonment would result in a mockery of the law. Uh, the attorney general felt that a life sentence would not resist an attack of public consensus, meaning that if the public heard about it, they wouldn't like it either. 
Uh, they then said, noting that while a verdict for manslaughter had not been allowed to be considered by the jury, if they had been convicted, no judge would have inflicted more than three months imprisonment for, you know, killing and eating a teenager. Uh, based on all that advice, Harcourt recommended that the Queen commute their sentence to six months imprisonment. Uh, Dudley and Stevens were very disappointed to hear about their six months imprisonment. They felt that they should not have been imprisoned at all for eating that young man. And there is an interesting question that I had when I first read this case and that I have maintained the whole time through our talking tonight. The case is called R.B. Dudley and Stevens. R meaning Regina, the Queen. The, in, in England, the Queen's Court are the people who, who charge you. The Crown is your prosecutor. And it's R.B. Dudley and Stevens. But there were three people who killed and ate Richard Parker. The third one being Edmund Brooks. How did Brooks get away with it? Did they just say, well, he just had a little taste. He, did, he didn't really, you know, he didn't go whole hog. He just had a little taste of the boy. Yeah, I see Scuff thinking. I don't know. I want to know. Like, like I see Scuff, so do I. I can't find anything on how Brooks got away oh, with I it. I haven't found anything. You, like, I, I love Slippery Sound and say. Back. Wait, wait, wait. Call back to a few weeks ago. Maybe his defense attorney said that he was just disciplining the child and it was an absolute defense to the, the crime. Uh, I mean, I, I love it. And, and it's like, I, I love it. Slippery Stallion says he was asleep. Slippery Stallion, for the people listening, being somebody in the live chat, but actually says, uh, when I'm reading this, Brooks had not been a party to the earlier discussion and claimed to have signaled neither assent nor protest. In other words... Brooks basically said, those two guys are the ones who decided to kill and eat him. I just came in after the fact and said, well, he's already dead. Um, I had no part in the killing part. I took part in the eating. That I did do. Yes, I ate that young man. But I had nothing to do with killing him. Maybe it was the conflict between the accounts. Maybe it's because Brooks said, uh, I didn't have anything to do with deciding to kill him or killing him. It was Dudley and Stevens. And of course, Dudley's like, no, we were all in it together. And Brooks is like, no, we weren't. Fuck you. Um, <laughs> and the crowd was just like, you know what? We're not going to argue about this. We're going to choose the two guys who bold faced in their deposition and said, we chose to kill this kid. And those are the two we're going to fucking try because those are the two that there is no legal question that they killed them. You, Brooks, don't eat anybody else. Bad. Bad boy. <laughs> so, uh, th what came out of this case was really the idea that, as I've said a couple times now, necessity is not a defense to murder. Uh, now, is that really true, Scuff? I mean, statutorily, it's literally written into the language of the necessity statute now, so... Yes, it is literally true. I mean, but is it when you think about it? Because what is self-defense other than really a defense of necessity? Uh, I mean, self-defense is different because you have a direct actor, right? I mean, like, in necessity, the idea is you are acting upon someone who is not directly acting on you. Self-defense requires you to be acting against the actual person who's acting against you. Now, let's put this in a uh, philosophical. We all know about the trolley problem, right? Uh, there's a switch on a track, and if you flip the switch, one person dies. If you don't flip the switch, three people die. Do you flip the switch? From a legal perspective, based on the holding of R.V. Dudley and Stevens, the answer would be, don't touch the fucking switch. Because if you hit the switch, you've just committed murder. Saying, I did it so two more people could live, likely would not hold up. Thoughts? 
I've made stuff. When that case when that case comes around, I will <laughs> When when we have the case of somebody to say, Oh, those three people fuck them. Uh <laughs> Well, yeah, when, I mean, when the case when the case comes around, I will I'll I'll tell you my thoughts. <laughs> it's a weird hypo. I it is, yeah. isn't it? Like especially when you hear that, because because I'm sitting here, I'm thinking, you know, if you read it, the trolley problem legally isn't a problem. It's the second you touch the switch and and flip it, you've committed murder. You've facilitated yeah. a murder. Uh, well, you have no duty to intervene. Right. So. Yeah, the the three other people died, or, or would have died if I didn't do that. Well, it doesn't matter to us. You should have let those three people die. So, does that mean that the law always does good public policy? No. I, I Yeah, of course not. What if those three people are three scientists working on the cure to cancer, and the one person on the other track is... I, I don't know. Give me an example here. Mitch McConnell. Um, I'm from Kentucky. I can say that. Um, this is why this is why jury nullification exists. Because yeah. there are circumstances beyond the, you know, there are moral circumstances that individuals have to consider when they're sitting in the jury room. But but legally speaking, if you threw the switch uh, saying, well, but if I let those three die, the cure for cancer wouldn't be discovered for another hundred years you've still committed murder and you're still liable and saying I threw the switch so that humanity as a whole would benefit would not be legally defensible under this act. It would not fall under the defense of necessity because the law says no one human life is worth more than another when set beside each other and people cannot be arbiters of whose lives mean more. Yeah, but we already know how this goes in practice. Oh, yeah, we do. Because we already have an example. We we definitely know how it goes in practice. Well, I mean, we have an actual, like, honest-to-God example. Torture is illegal. Torture is absolutely illegal. And people have been tortured. Known, confessed torturers exist in this country who have never been prosecuted because they say they had to do it in a wartime scenario, and they were never prosecuted. The law says they're guilty. And they could be prosecuted, but the prosecutors who were involved in that made the discretionary choice not to prosecute them. That is the, like, that's literally the trolley problem. Like, they committed a crime that does not have a defense of necessity. They are guilty. They were not prosecuted because at the end of the day, prosecutors have discretion. The prosecutors at that time decided to exercise their discretion and not prosecute them. And if you really want to, like, if that's the example, if you could just kind of extrapolate it out, if you have the trolley problem, someone's probably guilty of murder, but I would say most prosecutors that I've ever met would have just let that one slide. Now, this this is the time at Booze's Legal Funhouse where I turn to the Discord and I bring up general questions that we have received on tonight's topic from the Patreon subscribers and the uh, the Twitch supporters out there. Um, and I, I want to warn you, Scuff, because I announce the topic on the day of each recording. Uh, and I say, get all your questions in 15 minutes before we start. And the moment I said, we're going to talk about cannibalism tonight, there were a lot of questions. <laughs> I'm not an expert in cannibalism, Boozy. Well, I hope you are, motherfucker, because we're going with it. Uh, The first question, if I am a beneficiary in a will will, and I make a meal of said body, does it affect my standing in the will? Actually, yes. If, if If you kill them, if you are the cause of their death, there is something called the Slayer Statute in a lot of jurisdictions that comes into effect and treats it as if you predeceased them, if you died before them, thus depriving you. Now, if you're just talking about eating them, I don't think so. Like, like if they died of natural causes, and you like people have left their riches to their cats through trust before, and you know if they weren't found, fa- like if they're that person who left their money to their cats, you know they weren't found until those cats started going meow mix on their face. So, I mean, in what I, oh God, weird lawyers can ruin every fun joke by just talking about the law enough. 
what would most likely happen in that scenario is honestly a civil tort for the desecration for infliction of emotional distress for desecrating the body and if whoever else had a potential interest in the wealth would just sue the cannibal for inflicting emotional distress and they would get presumably possibly the money and since the money would have to go through probate anyways it's actually a really good way to get a payout because you have a guaranteed amount of money sitting somewhere so yes i can ruin anything by talking about well let's extrapolate that a little more there was a case in utah where a woman was driving a car she was the sole heir of her husband's estate she was driving a car uh her negligence caused the car accident that killed her husband she was the executor of the estate and the sole beneficiary and in her role as executor she sued herself for wrongful death to get the insurance payout now say that you have an insurance company uh, company that covers uh criminal payouts or, or civil payouts resulting from your conduct in your home and you are the sole beneficiary and executor of the estate, the person dies, could you eat them and then sue yourself for desecration to get the insurance payout related to the tort verdict? God, that seems like fraud. It does, doesn't it? But is it? Maybe you were really hungry. Fraud is, like, so weird. Like, there's a million statutes for it, and you always think you know, like, oh, that's clearly fraud. And then you look up the fraud statute, and there's so many clauses that you're like, I'm not sure this applies to anyone. I, I, I will tell people it's fraud until we do discovery. Um, <laughs> you know, they, they, it sounds like fraud, but let's just be honest. When we get to discovery, the fraud count's going away. Um, uh Another question, does the ship of Theseus paradox apply here? If I consume part of a person before they are dead, uh, am I not now partially that person? Can I make a claim of ownership for their rights and belongings because of the fact they are now me? I think that's just assault. <laughs> like, it's battery. like, yeah, I, I think that's just a tort at that point. A couple crimes probably, too. Lawyers do not do metaphysics. Uh, is drawing lots common law, or is it sailor tradition? We actually answered that. That is sailor tradition. Uh, you would draw lots for that. Assuming it is, what would you charge if you believe someone cheated at drawing lots? Nothing, because that motherfucker ate somebody. Um, is I mean, there... you don't have to charge anything now, because necessity is <laughs> not a defense. So you can just, uh, just charge him with murder. Is there a minimum distance in time applying here? How long do I have to wait and how far away from the dock do I have to be before I can eat someone? That is actually a question I can answer. Uh, you hear, of course you can. Yeah, you, you hear a lot about international waters. Everything's legal in international waters, right? Except it's not. The law of the flag of the vessel, where the ship is, is registered, where it's flagged at, follows the vessel. Anything that happens on that vessel ostensibly happens under the law of the country on which it is flagged. So, no, you can't like go out to see murder somebody and then return home. Be like, I murdered them, but it was in international waters, so it's fine. Because these guys were probably technically international waters when they killed and ate a 17-year-old. But because the lifeboat was from a English-flagged vessel, the courts of England had jurisdiction. Uh, is there, uh, let's see, what about doggy, fuck you, uh, what, what about doggy bags? <laughs> like, can, can you keep some of their, uh, it's actually from the, uh, the Exeter, or the Essex shipwreck, the Moby Dick inspiration, where when some of the survivors were found, they were, like, scrambling to bring on the bones and marrow of their shipmates that they had eaten from the lifeboat to the rescue ship, because that's how delirious they were. Uh, more you know what the real you know what the real crime is is that we haven't had sea shanties going this entire time in the background like we should have but music we should have had some like accordion music playing behind us as we discussed this like, like if only i had copyright non-drm protected sea shanties queued up uh does drawing lots count as a game of luck or skill and would anti-gambling laws be involved uh, 
If gambling laws are at play, this implies that a person's flesh can be at stake in a game, potentially even if not then consumed. How does all of this shift if it is self-cannibalism? I'm, I'm really not aware of any laws that say you can't eat yourself. Are there laws that say you can't eat yourself? No. Maybe. <laughs> it's so weird because, like, you're in a... Whenever you're... Eh, that that takes it into... I, this takes it into the realm of very not fun really fast. <laughs> if we want to start talking about that. Uh, Sue Deer has requested, how do food safety regulations apply here? Yeah, that's actually one of the things I'm curious about on all of these, like, ship cannibalism cases, is, like, when does the body start to rot, and, like, that starts killing people, too? Like, like how fast does something rot at sea? You probably got a couple days. Really? Yeah. I mean, like, I wouldn't want No wanna... refrigeration. I mean, like, I wonder how preservative seawater is. Yeah, I mean, like soak them in some brine, a, a nice, uh, a nice brined cabin boy, and pop them in the oven for three hundred degrees, about ten hours. Get yourself a nice well, roast going. Well, and then that, like that, actually raises some interesting questions to me because I'm wondering how, like, how salination of like flesh when you don't have fresh water, how that contributes to dehydration. I have like so many more science questions than I have legal questions right now. Like I have some cookery questions. Like, how do you stuff them? Um, yeah. Well, they're already out of food, so not with bread. Yeah, like, like what? What do you use for seasoning out there? Salt. So, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that's maybe you just leave them in the sun long enough. You got a nice little Richard Parker jerky going on. I mean, they had. Well, they probably ate their shoes. I was gonna say they had shoes, but they probably ate those first. Oh, uh, what if you water and fertilize plants with flesh and blood and then eat the plants? Is that still cannibalism? How about indirect cannibalism? You feed the flesh of a human to an animal and later eat the animal. I, I mean, well, the second one, I would say feeding it to the animal is a is a superseding cause there. It's not really cannibalism at that point. It'd be like if somebody's falling out of an airplane and you jump out and shoot them. The cause of death is really the shooting. It's not when they hit the ground, even though uh, hitting the ground would also kill them. Feeding them to the animal is a superseding cause that negates the cannibalism. I, lo I love that I've taken Scuff's night and made him stare silently into the abyss as we talk about whether or not cannibalism by proxy is something you can actually oh, come accomplish. On. This, isn't, this isn't even close to making me stare into the abyss. I'm just, like, I'm trying to math out the, like... Like, do we need a white... You... Do I need a whiteboard here? Like... <laughs> Come on, you know what I do for a living. Nothing makes me stare into the abyss anymore. <laughs> like, like get a little PowerPoint going. Of, you know, if you feed person A to pig B and then serve them up as pork roll C, See, this person D engage direction. in eating. <laughs> like if you have like cow, like if you have cows grazing in a field that you've used as a graveyard. I don't think so. Oh, I you're think like, you're disconnected enough by then. Yeah, you're like yeah, you're like okay, well the body is fertilizing the grass and the grass is something we feed the cows that I then kill. Yeah, I think that's enough of a disconnect. I'm I, I would say that I, you only need one link breaking the chain there. I, like if I kill you and feed you to a pig and then grind the pig up into sausage, I'm eating the pig, not you. I don't need all these extra steps of decomposition and such. I you know, I have desecrated a corpse, but I have not engaged in cannibalism. Yeah, I think we're good. So, uh, Slippery Stallion is asked, if cannibalism is necessary, how much is allowed, and could you be charged with gluttony? Gluttony is a sin, not a crime. Uh, so I would say, if cannibalism is necessary, I mean, hey, I know there are places that, pro that have laws against cannibalism. I, I know that's a thing. Um, I don't know where. I just know they exist because I've seen lawsuits about it. Um, 
But I, I would say, like, no amounts really allowed. But if it's not illegal where you are, I mean, gluttony is not a crime. It's a sin. So be an atheist and eat all of Timmy you want. Well, a brief Google search of cannibalism and KSA does not reveal a statute on point immediately, so I don't know. Well, and, and maybe it's like one of those things where, like, necrophilia, you really charge as desecration of a corpse a lot of times. But can I ask, if they're artfully prepared, is it really desecration of a corpse? Like, what if you have a French chef and butcher in there? Yeah, right? that's, that's, there we go. You actually got it right. Yeah. KSA desecration. Wait, does the chaos, does your statue for desecration say, like, don't eat the pit, the people? I, that's what I'm looking up. That's why I have to Google these things. <laughs> while, while you're Googling, uh, we actually have a non-cannibalism related question. Good. Uh, and this is from Hayd Fox and hearkening back to our discussion on juries at the very opening. Having never served on a jury, how does it work to be a juror? Uh, I have been called for jury duty and I have selected juries and, uh, generally how it works is you receive your jury summons. You check to make sure that you need to report. You report, you go into a big room, you fill out a questionnaire. They come in, uh, they basically say, okay, we need jurors for this case, this case, and this case. And they select a bunch of you and you go out and you go through voir dire, which is the attorneys asking you questions and using strikes, uh, either strikes for cause or unquestioned strikes. Uh, a strike for cause being something like uh, if it's a death penalty case, you say you could never consider the death penalty. That's a real strike for cause. You have to be able to consider the maximum punishment that can be given for the crime to serve. Otherwise, you'll get struck for cause, which means removed from the jury. Uh, and then, like, preemptory strikes where they can just go, I don't like this guy, and throw him out. And they do all they do that over and over again until they have selected the requisite number of jurors plus the requisite number of alternatives, normally 12 plus 2, um, to sit on the trial. And when you sit on the trial, you're going to hear the facts, you're going to hear the evidence. Uh, you are expected to take notes and to pay attention. And then there's closing arguments. The judge gives you instructions, which is like, this is the law. And trust me, we fight over what the jury instructions are going to say, because that's going to be your presentation of the uh, the charges. That's, that's going to be your charging to the jury as the jury to consider that and the strictures of the law. And a lot of times the jury verse like, hey, do you find that they violated the contract? Yes. Do you find that it was violated on this date? Yes. If yes, go to blank. If no, go to blank. And it walks you down the verdict slip like that. Uh, and you reach a decision, hopefully. And then you come back out and you read the decision. And then they, uh, they may poll you afterwards. The polling of the jury being uh, how many of you voted for this, especially in mistrials where there's a hung jury. Uh, they will poll the jury very heavily. The vast majority of juries that are selected may not actually hear a case. A lot of cases can settle or have police taken right before trial. So you may go and sit there, not be selected for a jury, and leave because they've already impaneled the jury and then have to return sometimes for several days in a row uh, until that trial session's over. Or you may be selected for a jury and then told, nope, we don't need you. Uh, a lot of times that will fill your jury obligation. Here in Pennsylvania, uh, you can be called for jury duty once every three years as long as you report for jury duty. Whether you are selected to sit on a jury or not, you do not get called again for, th for the three-year period. Uh, so you have like a rolling three years from you've called for jury duty, you report it for jury duty, uh, selected or not, you then have three years where they can't call you. And it, it's important to mention what juries decide are not the law. That's why the judge actually gives you jury instructions and chargings on that and why you get the verdict slip. Because what the jury is supposed to decide is issues of fact. Issues of law are reserved for the judge and are normally pretty well settled by the time the case comes to the jury. That's why we spend so much time arguing about jury instructions, depending on what side you are, because you want the jury instructions to present the law in the way most favorable to your side. Scuff, any comments? Uh, if you 
I would not. I would highly recommend you don't try to get off of a jury. I've had judges hold people in contempt when they thought they weren't being serious about their answers during jury selection, what we call voir dire. Um, and as I warn every juror at the start of voir dire, uh, not saying something, not saying anything, not answering any of my questions is about the easiest way of getting on a, one of my juries. Oh, yeah. Uh, if you sit there and you do not respond to a single question, people think you're generally chill. People who talk a lot tend to get struck. But don't lie. Don't make it obvious you're trying to get off of a jury or you uh, may find yourself paying a fine to the court. Yeah. Now, a common question that we get, and we may wrap up on this one because it is 825. Uh, a common question that lawyers will get is, do you have to serve on juries? And for me, as a private attorney, the answer is yes, I can get called for jury duty. Uh, I report for jury duty and I can be selected for jury duty. Just being a lawyer will not get me out of jury duty. Uh, with some exceptions, like the federal uh, district here, I got a jury duty summons once. I sent back a little note saying I am an attorney and I cannot be out of my office for the time it will take to sit for trial. And the judge released me immediately on local cases. They're like, nope, motherfucker, you're coming in. Uh, so uh, Hamswitch has asked, do you like having lawyers on your jury? Uh, yes and no. It depends on the case. Yeah, it really does. There's some cases that are so complicated. You want a lawyer on the jury because a lawyer will grasp and explain the concepts that you're getting at. There's other cases where you're like, I don't want a fucking lawyer on that jury. <laughs> I don't want a lawyer telling them why I'm wrong. <laughs> I So I, as wrap up, I have one, one final story for tonight. Go ahead. So I, I have been called for jury duty twice in my life. Um, once I got off because... I no longer lived in the jurisdiction, so they lit I literally could not sit on that jury. You have to live in the jurisdiction to sit on the jury. The second time was in a jurisdiction I worked in. When I was a prosecutor, I got called, and there was one case going the entire day. So, like, all of the cases are scheduled for Monday. Every jury trial went away except for one, which was mine. So I walked into the jury pool or the jury clerk in the morning and I said, uh, I am not going to be able to sit on this jury. And the, the jury clerk says, why? And I'm like, because I'm prosecuting the case and I'm pretty sure I know what my verdict would be. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that well, with that wonderful story, we will wrap it up tonight. And for this episode of Booze's Legal Funhouse, thank you all so much for tuning in, whether you tuned in live or whether you're listening to it later on a podcast. As always, I am the Boozy Barrister, Boozy Badger. My guest tonight has been the wonderful Scuffin' Dings. Squeak. <laughs> thank you. We, we had to get that one uncomfortable moment in for the people who like, I thought this was a law show. Um, if you like what we do here, please go to your podcast service of choice. Rate it five stars. You can go to patreon.com slash lawyers and liquor and become one of our monthly supporters. And if you don't want to do that, that's just fine. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you'll listen again next time. Until next time, I am Boozy. This has been Boozy's Legal Funhouse. Thank you and have a wonderful rest of your day. Okay. Cool. Yeah, let me roll the credits, and you and I will talk over the credits like we normally do. I need that little sound break there to, for when I'm editing to make sure that it doesn't doesn't do the things that I I don't want it to do and catch all of our shit. Uh, I should probably actually switch over to, to the screen so that our faces aren't showing instead of the credits. How have you been, Scuff? I've been okay. Work's been insane. They're out picking up like now that covid's over they're picking up all of our outstanding warrants so it's just been like oh. way too many cases yeah and now, uh the the chat's I'm like does, does scuff know his mic slide yes scuff has been on before he knows that i talk over the credits <laughs> it's it's been wild uh we charge a lot of, we've been charging cases throughout COVID, but because of jail capacity and not wanting to put people in, they haven't been picking people up on them. 
and they've been picking people up on the warrants. So like my first appearances were going from about 15 to 